I'll have a couple of slides that, that have graphs on them, but very little in the way of that. What I want to really talk about are the, the, the practical aspects of, first of all, building big data, um, and then working out how to use it. Uh, and so those are really going to be the, the topics of, of my talk. Um, I'll start off by just describing on the first slide what the UK Biobank uh, is and, and what it's about, and then tell you um, how we've gone about uh, building it uh, and where we are in terms of um, um, what it might achieve over the next few years, because it's been 10 years in building, um, but it's a project that really will only start to become of value uh, over the next decade. Um, it's a very large scale, very long term projects. But the, the longer that time goes on, the more valuable it will be for understanding the determinants of an increasing uh, range of different diseases. I should first start, I guess, by, by pointing out who's funding it. <clears throat> so um, it was mentioned that I'm the chief executive. Uh, Lord knows why anybody would make me the chief executive. I'm an academic. But uh, the, 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 the thing is that, that Wellcome Trust, which is a charity, um, and the Medical Research Council, which is government funding, set it up, set up UK Biobank as a charitable company, really to try to, so, so they are the two owners of it, um, and that's really to, to protect this um, extraordinarily valuable resource. But it's also had funding from the Department of Health and the Scottish and Welsh governments and the, 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 the two charities, the British Heart Foundation and Diabetes UK. So, so in summary, what is it? It is uh, half a million British men and women who were 40 to 69 when they joined the study. Uh, we knew they were 40 to 69 um, because they were identified with the help of the National Health Service um, as people who lived uh, near to the places that we set up assessment centres to recruit people into the study. So we had their, their, their names and addresses, um, dates of birth of all of the people within those age ranges and we invited people to, to join the study, um, as, as simple as that. Um, so that was their age um, during two th between 2006 when we did the initial pilot phase in, uh, in Manchester um, through to the middle of 2010 when we completed recruitment. We asked lots of questions, and I'll go into that in some detail, um, uh, made a number of measurements, and we're still making measurements on the people who joined the study, and we stored lots of different biological samples, and again, I'll go into the, the detail uh, of that. Um, and on top of that, we are looking at opportunities to get more information about the people who are in UK Biobank. We want to understand as much about um, the way they live, the exposures that they live in, um, their genetics, in order to have the fullest picture possible about um, what might be the, the, the determinants of them developing particular conditions. So we can understand the causes and work out ways to prevent and treat disease. Over time, we invite subsets of the participants back uh, in order to try to understand whether the things that we measured at baseline are changing. Um, are people changing their lifestyle? Are their exposures changing? We don't have to do that in everybody to work out what kinds of changes are occurring for the whole of the, uh, this cohort. Importantly, um, uh, we built this resource for anyone to use for any health-related research that's in the public interest. So one of the biggest obstacles that we've had um, really to UK Biobank is people understanding, researchers understanding, that it's not our resource, it's their resource. It's a resource there for researchers anywhere in the world, academic or commercial, um, to use to try to work out how to improve health. So any kind of health-related research in the public interest. And we don't know what people will want to do, um, uh, what kinds of research they'll want to do, how they'll want to do it. And so we had to get agreement from um, the participants to this very general consent for the use of the resource for um, all kinds of um, purposes. And I'll go into the kinds of protections we have to make sure that it's used in the right way. 
We also need to know what happens to people. Um, and because we've got half a million people, we need very efficient strategies for working out what's happened to people. So we're using linkage to health records, um, and so we have to have consent for that linkage. And the reason why we have half a million people is that, of course, only um, uh, some of them will develop any particular disease. And uh, it sounds a bit morbid, but really it's the ones that develop a particular condition that will help us to understand the causes of that condition. Uh, and so we need to have enough individuals that develop any particular condition over the next 10, 20, 30 years in order to say, well, what's the dif what are the differences in the environment, the lifestyle, the genes, other measures in the blood um, between the people who do and don't develop disease? And so that'll go into my first graph. Um, and I want to try to give you a sense of, of why we need such a big study. So I'm going to show you some real data um, where, not from this study, but from a um, similar kind of study where uh, we pulled together the data from, from these kinds of studies where people had measurements made at the beginning and then they've been followed long term. Uh, and so I've, I, we managed to get some 60 studies from around the world, and we've combined all the data from those studies. So we've got about a million people with around 12 years of follow-up. Um, and in that collection, we've looked at a number of risk factors that were measured in these old studies and the association with the risk of um, dying of particular causes. And what I'm going to show on the next slide is the association between blood pressure and the risk of dying from heart disease. Um, now, you'll be aware, you know, when you go to your, your GP, they measure your blood pressure. Um, if your blood pressure is too high, they often try and persuade you to take blood pressure-lowering agents to reduce your risk of having a heart attack, reduce your risk of, of, of having a stroke. Um, and that is largely driven by the kind of data that I'm going to show you. But to show the value of scale, what I'm going to do is show what happens if we didn't have a million people in this collection, but we only had 5,000 people, 50,000 people, and 500,000 people. So how clearly can we see the associations that we know exist between blood pressure and the risk of death from heart disease? So this is 5,000 people. Along here, I've plotted the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure, which is the higher of the two measures that you used. And on here, I've plotted the risk of death from coronary heart disease, from heart, heart attacks in particular. And these lines are showing where I would plot the risk versus the blood pressure for people who die of heart disease at different ages, from 40 up to up to 80. And around the, the points, whoops, I'm sorry, I've hit something wrong there. Might need audiovisual help here. Thanks very much. Um, so around each, ah, oh, thanks very much. Around each of the points, I'll know not to hit that one, thank you. Um, this is the, this is a kind of range of uncertainty, the random error around where I would put, uh, uh, plot the risk. And the random error around where you would plot it is much bigger when you have very small numbers of events. So you can't be very precise about where you would plot the risk. And you can see a kind of gradual slope up. So it's suggesting that people with a higher blood pressure have a higher risk. But there's a lot of uncertainty about where I would plot the risk because it's based on only 5,000 people and on relatively small numbers of events. Take it up to real, this is all real data, so increase it by tenfold. The uncertainty about where to plot the risk is narrower. These vertical lines are, have closed up. And we get a clearer picture that there is an increasing risk with increasing blood pressure. And we can see that the older individuals have higher risk. So we're now getting discrimination. It's a little bit like 
taking a, a telescope or a microscope and starting to get things into focus. We take it up another tenfold and all the random error starts to disappear and we start to see these very clear associations. So whereas over here we couldn't be sure that increasing blood pressure was really in associated with increasing risk in older people. And in fact, for a long time, many doctors didn't uh, give blood pressure lowering therapy to elderly individuals who had high blood pressure because of these kinds of associations. It looked like it flattened. So, so the random error was actually driving treatment incorrectly. When we get the scale up big enough, then we get these very clear pictures of the shape of the association. You can see the lower the blood pressure, the lower the risk, irrespective of age. Uh, and really this is just to illustrate um, for a, a major risk factor like blood pressure and um, coronary heart disease, even with a common condition, you need to have these very large studies to be able to get the precision of the association. So back to Biobank. We set up the assessment centres in all sorts of places around the UK um, uh, in order to try to get the widest range of people to, be, to take part. So uh, we wanted to get a real mix of individuals um, because the wider the range of their exposures, the, 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 the more different they are, the more informative Biobank will be about um, lifestyle. You know, if, for example, you only studied people who smoke 20 a day, you wouldn't be able to work out that smoking was dangerous because you wouldn't have anybody who smoked zero a day. You need to have people with, very, with big differences to be able to determine um, what's good and what's bad. And by locating them in um, different places, we could get a mix of ethnicity, um, deprivation, rural and urban. And um, we got a good uh, spread of younger individuals, uh, older individuals, male and female. We had these running at weekends uh, in order to uh, facilitate uh, participation from people um, who were uh, um, working, had them in the evenings or early in the morning. Um, and it's one of the things that people find very difficult with this is they say, well, you didn't get everybody um, who you invited to take part. Uh, and they say, well, it's, it's not representative um, uh, of the population. And that's true. Um, if we ask the people in UK Biobank, you, who's going to win the next election? Who are you going to vote for? It may not be an accurate representation of what will happen um, in the next election. They may well be selected uh, in all sorts of different ways. Um, that's not important. What we, what we uh, need is this, the differences. We need younger and older. We need men and women. Uh, we need people with different levels of, of deprivation, a range of different exposures. And so one of the, the complications that people have when they think about these studies is they think, well, they're not representative. Not, not all the people who are invited turned up. And as I said, it doesn't matter. What we're interested in is generalizability. Can we generalize these results that, that people get from looking at the determinants or the risk factors? Um, can we generalize those to different populations? Can we generalize them in the future? Will they tell us, um, as with the previous sl uh, slides, about blood pressure and the risk of disease or genetics and the risk of disease? And the answer is, provided they will to the extent that we have um, heterogeneity, we have a range of different exposures. The other you know, obvious problem when you're trying to get half a million people is it's, that's a lot of people. How do you get a lot of information from a lot of people? Um, and scaling things up, as you'll be aware, just taking what you do and doing it in 100 times more people is not going to work. Um, you have to actually have a, an approach that, will, that is scalable that can really work with very large numbers. So we essentially turn this recruitment into a, a production line. Um, we had to make sure that we had 100 people per day coming to each of the assessment centers 
to appointment times. We had six assessment centres running at any one time. Um, if we went to 110, then the system broke. If we were under 90, we ran out of money. So we had to, you know, we became like an airline. We had to book and overbook and have flexibility that we could deal with overbooking um, uh, in order to keep at 100 a day, six centres a day. Um, and we wanted to get as much information as possible. So people came into our reception area and they might turn up late, they might turn up early, they might turn up having not told us they were coming. And so we had this kind of buffer, which was a touchscreen questionnaire area, where rather than using interview, which is what these kinds of studies normally do, a one-to-one -one interview, um, which would have been very expensive given the amount of questions we wanted to ask, people had their interview with a touchscreen questionnaire, um, with a touchscreen computer. Um, and the nice thing about this is it kind of it buffered. So if more or fewer, or fewer people came in, then th this produced a, more, a steadier stream of people coming into the next phase. And different people could take different amounts of time. And interestingly and unexpectedly, what we found was although people could, split, could skip any, any question if they found them too intrusive, and the questions were quite detailed about lifestyle exposures and um, how fast you, do you really drive on the motorway and things like that to try and get at risk, risky behavior. Um, and some other kinds of risky behaviour I won't go into. Um, but uh, although people could skip questions, they didn't. And I think part of that was it, was it was private. You weren't having to answer questions where you thought you might be overheard to a person you'd, never, you'd only just met. You could do it straight into the computer. Um, so we got very complete information. And then people, uh, in the light of those answers... The, the nurses who did interviews could do informed interviews, particularly around um, uh, asking more questions about um, uh, specific medical conditions that had been reported, they reported on the touchscreen. So we could keep the cost of the face-to-face -face down. Then people th moved through a another set of measures, eye measures, physical measurements, fitness tests, blood and uh, urine and saliva collection, and then um, on to another uh, set of questions. So they were kind of moving through uh, this factory, 100 a day, day in, day out. And they, are, they were asked lots and lots of questions. So this is just all the types of questions that they were asked um, about their, uh, on, on the touchscreen. Um, and the nice thing about the computer question was that you know, if you were a non-smoker, you said you didn't smoke, then you didn't get asked, and when did you stop? You, know, you can have an intelligent question, a uh, computer question, so it will take you um, and you will skip a whole lot of uh, irrelevant questions. So you can see the amount of time uh, people took on all sorts of different questions. The other thing that we could do is that touchscreen uh, could go beyond an interview and, uh, and have... Um, tests and uh, games and tests and things in it. So we had psychological status uh, testing, cognitive function tests, hearing tests th that were all built into this um, very low cost uh, approach. And then as I said, just a very short interview. We did some very standard uh, measurements um, that uh, um, are kind of very obvious ones like blood pressure and um, the size of people, um, their lung function, their heel ultrasound, which tells you about bone density. Uh, but once we'd actually got this machine working, uh, the, the funders were keen on us adding in additional measures that we had wanted to do um, on people. So we added in a whole lot of other things. I mentioned the hearing tests, but we worked with Moorfields here in London to develop um, a, a set of um, measures around vision. Um, so people's uh, visual acuity, the uh, pressure inside their eye, which you do with a kind of puff of air onto the eye, those are familiar with an optician. But um, uniquely, uh, not just retinal photography, but what's called optical coherence tomography. Um, and the best way that I can describe it is it gives you 
pictures, not just of the surface of the inside of the eye, of the retina, but actually gives you pictures that show the different layers within the retina. So you can actually see the nerve fibers, the blood vessels. Um, it's like having histology of the inside of the eye from these photographs. And now the Moorfields group, um, along with other colleagues around the UK, are starting to analyze those images so they can look to see how they relate to uh, various of the other characteristics. The thing about this project is we don't know what people will want to do. So before we started, we had to work out what kind of blood and, um, or what kind of biological sample should we store in case people want to measure various things. Um, and not knowing what they, they want to measure, we had to kind of guess what sort of methodology they might use and then ensure that we collected the, the blood, the urine, the saliva in ways that would allow those different kinds of analytic methods to be used to measure things that we didn't know they'd want to measure, if you can follow my drift. Um, and so uh, we did a whole series of um, pilot experiments working out how to collect the blood, um, how to collect the urine and the saliva in ways that would allow um, lots of different kinds of assays to be done. Um, and, and so although you, these are just the different kinds of tube that were stored, these are just the different kinds of um, uh, parts of the, of the sample that can be stored. So, if you take a normal blood sample, um, typically that you would get taken it um, by your GP in, um, uh, with, with something called EDTA in it, which preserves certain things, you can spin the blood and you'll get three layers. You'll get the red cells, uh, which carry the oxygen around at the bottom. You'll get the, um, the, the kind of liquid, the, 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 the plasma at the top, um, where you would typically measure a lot of the, the biochemistry things in. And in between, you get the, the white cells, the, the, the cells that deal with infections. And in those white cells is the DNA. So, that, so we divide um, this particular tube into the plasma, the white cells, the buffy coat, and the red cells. And each of those is stored separately so we can analyze different things. And different kinds of samples were collected. Um, and then they were processed in our coordinating center in Manchester using a robotic system. And then half of it is stored in the coordinating center, and half is stored in a geographically separate area from each individual in case of disaster. So really, this is just talking about all the kinds of potential assays that could be done on these different samples. But now we've been thinking, well, what else would we like to, to know about? Um, when we did the questionnaire, by having the touchscreen questionnaire, we were able to take all, a lot of the suggestions that had come from experts around the UK and internationally about the sorts of things that you would want to ask people um, uh, if you were interested in lung disease or heart disease or cancer or eye disease or whatever. So we, we, can't, we were able to, to get quite a lot of the questions included. But there are some areas where um, the questions that can be asked are really not very precise. So particularly around, say, diet, if you ask people um, what is called food frequency questionnaires, how often do you eat these sorts of things, um, it can be reasonably informative, but not, not entirely informative about people's diet. They can give you a, a sort of vague idea, but really the ideal is to ask people what they have eaten to do diet diaries. And typically, um, when these diet diaries are done, uh, it takes a few hours to train people to, to, to complete them properly, and then it takes about um, half a day for an expert to analyze about two one-week diet diaries. So it's a very uh, time-consuming thing. Now, so you can imagine you can't really do that on half a million people. Um, but instead, uh, a group in Oxford developed a web-based diet diary that we sent out to people um, by email. They linked into it, and it, it took them through what did they eat yesterday. So they're just doing it for one day, um, and they were doing it on the web. It took about 10 minutes. Uh, they only had to remember what they did, did yesterday. And then a few months later, we would send it out again, and they would tell us what they ate. And then again, 
And again, so we could build up a, di a di diary. Uh, and because it was going into a computer system, it was being coded as it was being recorded. So we cut out all of the complications of training people to fill it in and training people to, to analyze it. So as I say, it was very quick, about 10 to 15 minutes, automated data collection and coding, easily repeatable so we can do it over, over time to get seasonal variation. Um, and we've been able to uh, get really detailed uh, nutrient intake data, and we've now put those data into the database uh, so they're available. And we've got over 200,000 participants completed it um, at least once, about 40 or 50,000 completed it about four times. And so we've got really much more complete information about diet than we would have got just from the food frequency questionnaire. We're looking to see whether we can use this approach of um, web-based questionnaires uh, to assess people's um, exposures, their lifestyle in more detail. Uh, so in the assessment center, um, again, because of time limitations, we only asked them about their most recent job. Now we're about to roll out a web-based questionnaire that will get the, f the full occupation history of the participants so that we can try to understand um, whether there are different kinds of occupation, um, different ways of working. Uh, so there have been associations claimed um, of people who, who do um, night shift work. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to use that to get more information about occupational history um, and also more detailed questionnaire about activity. But um, yesterday <coughs> we started a different kind of questionnaire um, which was not about people's exposures, but about their outcomes. And this is the one up here. So we're repeating um, and enhancing the assessment of cognitive function that we did at the baseline visit. Not looking at exposures, but now looking to see whether we can identify um, cognitive decline in participants. And this is something, again, we can repeat over time. Uh, we know that it's a massively underdiagnosed uh, health outcome, uh, that it's something that we're not likely to be able to pick up well through linkage um, to health records, even to primary care records. Uh, and so it may well be that by direct involvement with the participants, we can um, uh, make UK Biobank much more informative about what is clearly a, a major um, health problem for the next few decades. And, and so, you know, UK Biobank could become a unique resource in, uh, for, for studying the development of cognitive um, decline. I mentioned about physical fitness, uh, sorry, about physical activity. You can ask people about how active they are and they almost certainly lie. Um, or, or, or you can, you can um, uh, ask them questions about how active they are uh, and you ask them questions in ways that don't allow them, allow you, sorry, allow them to tell you um, so particularly around um, uh, housework, uh, it's very difficult to get questions that really get a, a sense of how um, much activity that involves. And so, um, uh, again, thinking about ways in which one can get at activity that are much more precise. Because imprecision in your measurement uh, results in, in systematic underestimation of the importance of a risk factor. So... So imprecision doesn't mean that you just get a, an imprecise result. It means you systematically will underestimate the importance of that risk factor. So it's important to take that into account. So we're, at the moment, we're now sending out activity monitors that people wear for a week um, and that will tell us directly about how active they are. So this is the activity monitor here. It's got a little um, electronic puck in here. Um, it looks a bit, the whole thing look, is about the size of a watch. Um, and um, interestingly, we've found that as we've been rolling out this process of asking people if they'll wear it, a higher and higher proportion of UK Biobank participants are saying yes. And we don't quite understand that. We don't know whether that's word of mouth and people who know other people who've worn them and said it's fine. Um, is encouraging others to, to do so. But I think we're nearly up actually at 50% of the people we ask um, wearing them for a week. We mail it out, it turns itself on, wear it for a week, turns itself off, um, and um, the letter says, uh, um, 
this is when you should send it back. So it's all uh, automated. And uh, this is the kind of trace. So it's recording um, uh, movement in three directions. It's one on the wrist. Uh, and you can see the different kinds of activity. This is someone who is jogging to work, working through the day, jogging home, doing the washing up, I assume, um, and then going to bed. Um, and um, what we're now doing is working with experts to say, well, can we take different kinds of, so you get different kinds of signal with different kinds of activity, and now they're working out ways to analyze these data to turn these, um, the different signals and the different intensity of the signals into energy um, so that we can say how active have people been, what kind of activity has it been, um, and then that will be a, another set of exposures uh, that can be correlated with health outcomes. But people, you can w continue to wear it all the time, so we can also use it to look to see whether um, people with different sleep patterns have different um, disease outcomes as well. So it's not just getting at how active you are, it can be about how inactive you are, uh, different kinds of activity, uh, but also can be used to look at things like sleep. <clears throat> We've got all these samples, all, the, all the, the, the blood and the urine and the saliva I described. What do we do with it? Well, I mean, it is remarkable what's happened over the last decade in terms of the ability to, um, to, to, to pull genetic information out of blood samples. Uh, so, as I mentioned to you, um, uh, the white cells have got the DNA in. Um, and uh, the DNA has, uh, is made up of, of these um, uh, markers. Um, so we've got about 3.3 3 billion markers across um, all your DNA. Um, different flavors. Uh, uh, different people have different flavors at different points. Uh, and what, um, what we're now able to do is measure um, uh, in an individual those different markers. What flavor do they have at each, at each point? Or which var what variant do they have at each point across the whole of the genome? Now, that would be what you'd call sequencing. So you'd sequence, you'd measure all 3.3 billion markers. Um, and what is it? You, just over a decade or so since the first person was sequenced. Um, and we're not there yet for half a million people although you will have heard David Cameron um, say uh, within the last year that um, the National Health Service is going to sequence 100,000 people over the next few years. Um, so we're not that far away. But before one gets to sequencing, one can get a lot of information from measuring um, markers across the whole genome. So you, you, you take markers distributed across the genome because the way in which we get genetic information is that we get lumps of it passed from generation to generation. So if you measure a marker, then within a population, within a, a say, UK population, if you measure a particular marker, the markers next to it will be known because a whole lump has been inherited within our population. The further you go away from the ones you've measured, the less sure you can be of the ones you haven't measured. But you can actually use the ones you measure to estimate, based on the sequence information that we have, that is where you've got all 3.3 billion markers measured in a, some people in the UK population, you can estimate the markers you haven't measured. It's kind of difficult to get one's head around, actually. Um, but it, it means that we can use really relatively inexpensive genotyping technology, or has become inexpensive, on half a million people. And that's what we're, we're doing. Um, so uh, we're measuring, not 3.3 billion, but we're measuring nearly a million, 800,000 markers um, uh, across the genome. Uh, some of these are mar markers are just uh, like signposts. They're completely, you know, they're not 
disease related. They're just telling us about the ones we don't measure. So they're distributed across. Some of them are known to be associated with disease or they're known to be associated um, with risk factors, blood cholesterol, blood pressure, things like that. Um, uh, and, and some of them are in particular areas uh, of interest within the bits of the, the genome that are, are known to produce um, proteins or, or code for proteins. But really one can think of them as just being signposts across the whole genome. Now, to give you some sense of how fast these things are moving, um, I talk about this estimation of the genotype, um, and in terms of, of big data. So we're measuring 800,000, and we're working with the, uh, the experts in the UK. Uh, and when we started this project about a year ago, they said, well, we'll be able to double, pretty much double the number that you measure. So we'll be able to estimate about 2 million markers. About two months ago, we had a kind of follow-up meeting discussing how big the data were going to be, and they said, well, you, there's a lot more sequence data in the UK population that we combine, we can combine with the work you're doing. So we'll be, able to not, we'll be able to estimate not 2 million, but 12 million. Earlier this week, we had a follow-up meeting, and they said, well, we, there's even more sequence data. So now we can estimate not 12 million, but 50 million. So we measure less than a million, but we will actually know with reasonable certainty the markers for about 50 million markers on all half million people. So you can start to see, you know, the, uh, but how do you deal with all of those data? How do you move it around? How do researchers make sense of it? That, that's a lot of data, and that's just the genotyping data. We're also trying to make the resource accessible because this is a resource that we're trying to make really easy to use for researchers anywhere in the world, academic or commercial, um, but also those working in disease areas that have never really had the opportunity to work on a resource like this. I mean, heart disease, cancer, are, from a research point of view, are well-funded. A lot of people work in those areas. But other areas, there hasn't been the level of funding, there haven't been these kinds of resources. And we want to make this resource available for studying those kinds of diseases, hearing, vision, dementia, um, joint disease. Um, uh, so, so the more we can make the samples into data, the, more e the, the easier it is for them to, to access it. So we're now running... Um, a, uh, at the same time, a number of assays, not of the, the DNA, but of the, um, the plasma and the urine, so that we um, know the blood lipid levels, so that we know how easily or, um, or not the blood clots, um, so that we have an idea about renal function, liver function, various markers that are known to be associated with cancers. Um, so we're measuring about 40 different markers in all half a million, and those data are going to go into the resource as well. Um, and as I say, the reason for doing that is that it, it increases the usability. So how do we make this resource accessible to researchers? Um, well, the best thing is making the samples into data. Um, if they have to come along and find the, the funding to analyze the samples, that becomes very expensive. But if we can um, turn it into data, it's much more accessible. If you do the assays um, all in one go on all half participants, you use up less sample, you can negotiate much lower prices with the people who make the assays, um, uh, and um, the quality of the data can be much better controlled. So having started doing this, we're now thinking about another set of, of markers, um, and particularly in the cancer area, uh, but, but also in other areas, uh, in, in joint disease and in cardiovascular disease, uh, infectious agents um, have been um, associated with a range of diseases. So um, working with um, uh, experts in the UK and internationally, uh, we're looking at um, uh, planning 
to turn uh, the samples into assays of a whole range of different um, infectious agents that have been linked with disease, although not compellingly. Um, uh, and so we would then be able to take genetic data, um, things like the, the, the blood lipids and renal function and kidney function and diabetes, infectious agents. So you can start to see uh, all the connections one could start to, to, to make. And so that's the next phase that we're kind of building up this resource. And then finally, and perhaps the, the uh, area that um, uh, was most um, surprising to, to people was the idea that we would then image a very large number of the people. So um, uh, can we actually um, really study the, the, um, uh, the imaging data on all of these individuals? So we're doing... Uh, we just started this. The plan is to image 100,000 of the participants um, with magnetic resonance imaging um, uh, of the brain, the heart, and the abdomen. You get some beautiful pictures. I'll show you one in a minute. Low radiation of bone and joint and body, which can pick up um, osteoporosis, uh, joint problems. Uh, but also, uh, this is a relatively... A uh, simple way of looking at fat distribution in the body, although you can get more detail, but they're more complex to obtain um, information from the MR. Uh, ultrasound of the carotid artery, which is the artery in the neck that supplies the brain, where you get narrowing. It can be associated with, um, uh, obviously, with, with disease associated with blood supply to the brain. But it's also um, a window into the, the state of the arteries in the body as a whole. Um, and then repeating many of the measures and collection of samples um, uh, from the original baseline assessment. Uh, and that pilot is running and, and running very well. It's also in collaboration with a new project um, uh, funded by the Medical Research Council uh, focusing on dementia. And so our, our hope is that if this moves forward, that we will repeat the imaging in about 10,000 people. So we can then look to see whether change in imaging measures, changes, say, in the brain, um, are associated with um, uh, the development of cognitive decline. Why is imaging interesting? So my second graph. Uh, same data, uh, the, the same data set that I was showing you before, the, the one million people. Um, and what this is showing is the association between body mass index as a measure of um, increasing obesity. Uh, so more obese, less obese, slim. Um, and the risks of heart disease and stroke. So body mass index is um, uh, just your, your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So it's just trying to get a sense of, um, given how high you are, how heavy are you? Um, and as you can see here, it's associated with very clear increasing risk of stroke, increasing risk of heart attack, heart disease deaths, um, above a level of about 22. Down the lower level, it's unclear whether the actually getting too slim um, is not a great idea. Uh, now, if you were a um, you know, Tom Cruise, for example, your body mass index will be very high. Not because you're obese, but because you have a lot of muscle. So it's, a very, um, it, it's not a very precise measure. It, it's a guide towards the amount of fat you have, um, but, but there is a lot of imprecision in it. And yet, it's very, very clearly related to disease risk. If you do a magnetic resonance image of the body, uh, this is work done by Jimmy Whitbell at Hammersmith. Here are two individuals, same age, same gender, um, same body mass index, same estimated percent body fat. But actually, in terms of the fat that can be measured from imaging, very, very different. Very different distribution 
of fat. So here we've got a lot of fat around the organs, about six litres of internal fat, compared with this individual who has very little fat around the organs. And so given that the very imprecise measure, body mass index, is so strongly predictive of disease, it's really inconceivable that the kinds of extra data we could get from imaging uh, of uh, the distribution of fat, you know, where is that fat, how much do you really have, and, where, and does the location really matter? It's inconceivable that's not going to be very strongly predictive of disease. And so uh, that's one example, but of course you can think of, of, of many others. I lied, third graph. Um, so one of the great successes of um, uh, the last 20 years, and you see it strikingly in Britain, are the extraordinary falls in uh, um, coronary, um, uh, and in fact cardiovascular stroke uh, uh, incidence rates and also mortality. Fantastic reductions over time. Some due to the reductions in smoking, much of it due to improvements in, in care. Blood pressure lowering therapy, blood cholesterol lowering therapy, much better treatments when people um, get into uh, coronary care units with a heart attack, much better treatments from, to prevent them from getting in there in the first place. And so we've got um, a population who are being um, protected against cardiovascular death. We've probably got increasing numbers of people who are surviving with some coronary da damage. And what we're seeing is an increase um, in a very common uh, arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, particularly among older people, um, but even... Um, in late middle age. And by contrast with most other areas of cardiovascular disease, the mortality associated with atrial fibrillation, which is the commonest irregularity of the heart, the mortality is not being reduced. We don't, re we don't really have a magic bullet for that. And part of the problem is we don't have good studies of the condition. So cardiac arrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation, um, are often markers of underlying uh, heart disease, and they are strongly related with um, the risks of stroke, um, so particularly clots going into the brain uh, and causing loss of function on one side, and of heart attacks. Um, uh, the problem is that it comes and goes. So atrial fibrillation, you, there are some people who have it all the time, but there are a lot of people who have it, and then they don't have it, and then they have it, and they don't have it. Um, and so it makes it very difficult to detect it. And there have been no large-scale studies um, of w where it has been properly detected uh, to find out um, what its significance is for disease and what are the main determinants. So... Our plan is to, 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 have, to, to create that large database. Um, and again, this is an opportunity where one can take a big project like UK Biobank and enhance the characterization of the participants, uh, particularly using some of the new technology that's around. So um, this, like a big sticking plaster, it's a bit like the uh, wrist-worn accelerometer it's got an electronic uh, puck in the middle. And you can see it, its size on a chest. It's like a big sticking plaster with a couple of electrodes onto the skin and then um, an electronic device that records the electrocardiogram constantly over a two-week period. You can shower in it. You can swim in it. So it can be kept on all the time. And What's been shown is that if you have about two weeks of monitoring, you can detect um, at least 85% of all of the atrial fibrillation. So this would be a way of really detecting pretty much all of the um, AF uh, that is occurring within the UK biobank uh, population. And this device uh, is reused. So people wear it for, for two weeks, it's mailed back, 
Um, you throw away the plastic bits, you keep the expensive electronic bit, uh, and then um, uh, mail out the, uh, a new setup. So it can be repeated over time. So that way, you can keep the cost of it down, and we could get data on 100,000 people. So we're just planning the feasibility of that. We've built our imaging centre in Manchester. We're imaging participants at the moment. And uh, our plan is to uh, um, ask them if they'd be willing to wear this at the end of the visit, mail it back to us after two weeks. And then hopefully we can, over the next five years, image the participants and get all these data. So that's finding out about the people. But what about what happens to the people? So we're linking them to death and cancer registries, we're linking them to hospital re registries, we're linking them to primary care uh, records. Um, we're starting to look at how we can link to other uh, uh, systems, and then, as I mentioned, we're going directly to participants with the web questionnaires about cognitive function. What are the challenges of big data um, in linkage? Regulation, bureaucracy and permission, despite everybody having given explicit consent for their data to be provided, the people who hold the data need to be persuaded to let go of it. When they do let go of it, there are all sorts of problems because they're all from different systems. So they all provide it in different ways with different coding structures. Um, uh, the death data are coded in one way, the hospital data in another way, the primary care data in yet another way by different suppliers, so different people who are coding primary care data code it in different ways. So our big problem is how do we get this into one um, cohesive set? And then how do we make these data available to researchers in ways that will be informative um, about uh, the disease outcomes? This is just to give you a, some kind of sense. Of course, the UK, as we know, is not one country. Uh, so from a point of view of a biobanker, you have to go to England for some of the data, Wales for some of the data, Scotland for some of the data. For the different data types of data, you go to different places. Um, so as I say, and they all use different systems. But we're getting there. So we've got the data into the resource for much of these sources, apart from primary care, and we're working on that at the moment. But what does it mean? What do the coded data actually tell us? When you talk about hospital coded data, this is data that's being coded by an administrative clerk for audit purposes or for administrative purposes, not necessarily for research or medical purposes. How accurate are they? How detailed are they? How complete are they? Do we need to go beyond the coded data? If it says someone has been discharged from hospital with diabetes, the researcher may need to know much more. They need to be much more certain about the diabetes. If it says stroke, well, what kind of stroke? And we have to do it at scale. These are the numbers of different kinds of conditions. And this is just a dozen or so conditions. These are the numbers of, of these events that we have to uh, turn into usable data for the researchers. How do we go about doing that uh, at this very large scale, which gets bigger and bigger as time goes by, where an increasing number of conditions um, uh, will become relevant? So our strategy um, has been we're, we really want to be sure that when we say someone has had a heart attack, they have. That's the most important thing, because if you have a lot of people who haven't really got the disease of interest, you can get the wrong answer. We need to have an approach that will work for the whole of the UK, that can be that is cost effective and scalable for these very large numbers. And also, what I've referred to as future-proofed, we need to be able to have enough information about the disease outcomes that a researcher uh, in 10 years' time can characterise that disease the way that they would want to. So, for example, with a cancer. You, a breast cancer is not just a breast cancer. You can subdivide them according to whether they have particular markers on the tumour. A stroke is not just a stroke. You can have a stroke due to a bleed or a stroke due to a clot. 
The strength due to a clot can be uh, due to a big clot in large vessels, or it can be narrowing of small vessels with quite different um, uh, causes. And so we need to be able to record enough information that in 10 years' time, um, a bit like the samples that we collect, people can go back to that information and subdivide the diseases with the knowledge they have then, uh, not with the knowledge we have now. So we've got a staged approach. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're using these linkages I just mentioned to find out whether people have probably had a disease. Um, and trying to use a lot of different sources, death data, cancer data, hospital data, primary care data, and going direct to participants to find out whether they've likely to have it. If we think they have, then taking those potential cases and linking them with other kinds of data, either from uh, disease registers, so there are often um, specialised disease registers, of, say renal disease or diabetes, or... Um, uh, other electronic records, imaging data now becoming electronic or um, uh, laboratory data, uh, to confirm that they've really had the disease. And then go another stage further and say, well, do we, can we go and look at their clinical records and um, ascertain what kind of case did they have? Can we get hold of the tumour collections, the tumour samples, in order that people can assay those can we look at detailed imaging? So we go from ascertainment, probable case, to confirmed case, to really subdivided case. And um, we focused on the most common conditions, first of all, but we're now working our way through with increasing numbers of experts around the UK uh, in terms of classifying um, a, a wider and bright, wider uh, range of conditions. So there we've got a resource. Who can use it? Anybody. Any bona fide researcher for all types of health-related research in the public interest. No preferential or exclusive access. They only have to cover the cost of using it, not building it. Um, we have to be careful with the biological samples, so that's why I was stressing how we're trying to turn the samples into data, uh, which makes it much easier to share. And they are required to make their findings public um, and to return the data to, to us so that other researchers can check their results. Perfect, pure peer review. If they've got it wrong, someone else can come along and show them. And you can go onto the website yourself and you can see what data is in there. This is open to everybody. Um, so you can go onto UK Biobank and, you know, if you're interested in. You can find out what variables there are. Um, you can look at all the different variables. Say you're interested in body and fat. You can then click there. You can see the distribution of that particular variable. Um, you can look at all the different information. Um, and then researchers who are approved can then apply to use the resource. And here's another um, obstacle that we find. Although it's open to academic and commercial researchers, very few commercial researchers have used it. Although it's available to people throughout the world, it's largely been UK researchers who've used it. Um, and so our job now, now that we've built the resource, is to encourage people to really believe that it is their resource. Our job was to build it, their job is to use it. And actually we're finding that that is one of the biggest obstacles to big data, is to persuade people that someone could do that, that, that Funders would fund, people would work on building something for others to use. Um, so, you know, what's special about UK Biobank? We've got information about people before they develop disease. So the disease itself doesn't change the risk factors. We've got the samples, we've got questions, we've got measurements, we've got linkage that tells us about them before they joined the project. It's extraordinarily detailed. I mean, really, there is nothing on this scale that has anything like the uh, exquisite detail about the participants. And as you can see, that's increasing as we do the genotyping, um, as we do the biomarkers, as we do the imaging, as we get people to wear increasing range of different devices. And it's big. You, 
it is the biggest such resource in the world. Uh, and it has occurred because of the altruism of the British population and of the Wellcome Trust and the MRC, but it's the participants that have agreed to take part in this and who continue to agree to take part in it. Out of a half a million people, only over the last 10 years, only 1,000 people have withdrawn. I mean, we're finding that, that people are prepared to really give more to this resource. The imaging visit takes four hours, and 40% of the people we invite are coming from UK Biobank, are coming and, and doing that. And at the end of the visit, 95% of them say they'll be prepared to come and do it again. So uh, there are lots of obstacles, but um, I mean, actually, it's been the most extraordinary uh, ride from the point of view of uh, myself and the team who've built it. Thank you very much.